February 3rd, 1959. Cesarino Fava is waiting on the glacier, staring up at the most beautiful mountain in the world, Cerro Torre. He's waiting for his friends, his heroes, Cesare Maestri and Tony Egger, to return from the cutting edge of climbing. They're at the end of the earth, the southern tip of Argentine Patagonia, a place known for the remote peaks that shoot up off the glaciers like sharpened teeth. It's a place that's also known for hellacious weather and deadly storms. And one of those storms has been ravaging the mountain for days. Surviving this would be a miracle. Among the vanguard, there, there were all these like whispers and things people had started hearing about this place called Patagonia. This is Kelly Cordes, alpinist, journalist, and author of The Tower, a chronicle of climbing and controversy on Cerro Torre. He's going to help us tell the story. So just a few years before, the tallest peak in the Chalten Massif, Cerro Fitzroy, it had just been climbed for the first time. But even then, the first ascensionists knew that the biggest prize in climbing lay across the valley. And from the summit of Fitzroy, Guido Magnone and Lionel Torre looked across and saw this spire, Cerro Torre. And they saw it and said like, now there's a mountain worth risking one's skin for. And Maestri and Egger were risking their skin because it had been six days and they were seriously overdue. They do have four people way down below at base camp. They were university students from Buenos Aires whom they hired to help them carry gear into the range. And then Fava was in a snow cave about 600 feet or so below Cerro Torre waiting for Edgar and my street to return. And this storm had just been raging and it had been going on for days and Fava must have felt very alone. And how could Fava not feel some guilt, right? This expedition had been his idea in the first place. He's an Italian expat living in Argentina, and he'd heard about Serratori and knew that only the very best climbers would be up to the task. To him, the man for that job was clearly Cesare Maestri. He had great faith in in these people. These were like heroes of his. And wanting to convince Maestri to come down to Argentina, Fava had written him a letter and in it... He uses this uniquely Italian saying, come here, you will find bread for your teeth. After Torre and Magnone returned from Fitzroy, the race for Cerro Torre was on. In 1958, the previous season, two groups of Italian climbers had gone to Patagonia to attempt it. On one team were Maestri and Fava, and on the other were Carlo Mauri and Walter Bernetti. Between the two teams were some of the best Italian climbers of their generation, and they were bitter rivals. The first year, neither team makes it very far. That only enticed Maestri more. He returned the following year with ice climbing legend Tony Egger. And now, after weeks of effort and years of anticipation, Fava begins to think that maybe Serratori is really impossible. Fava's waiting for them. He's waiting, 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 faithfully waiting. And at a certain point, he had essentially given up hope. And he he realized that that they had to be gone, that they weren't coming down. And he sees this speck, this, this dark spot lying in the snow. And Fava races up to the speck. And it's a person, but it's only one. And according to Fava, It was Cesare Maestri. Maestri, he's crumpled in the snow, half alive, his voice no more than a whisper. And Maestri raised his head and said only three words, Tony, Tony, Tony. This season on Climbing Gold, we present the four-part series, The Greatest Lie. Two of the best climbers in the world set out to climb the impossible, but only one came back. For the next five decades, climbers would connect the dots, ultimately unraveling the truth of one of climbing's greatest mysteries. Sometimes, righting a wrong comes at a cost. I'm Alex Honnold. I'm Fitz Cahal. And I'm Lauren Delaney Miller. This is Climbing Gold. Hope is the weapon of the weak. There is only the will to conquer. It's the most beautiful mountain in the world. If they weren't climbing Cerro Torre, where were they? We were always talking about the bolt chopping. We were just a little ahead of our time. This seemed like the work of a madman. They are the giants. They're the best. They're the kings and queens. I don't know as far as I'm concerned. We're just the pawns. Chapter 1. 
The Queen and the Pawns. Can you uh, can you describe Saratori for someone who's never seen it? Um, uh, it's a uh... good question. Saratori is. I think that Saratori is the most spectacular looking mountain on Earth. It's like something Walt Disney would have drawn as the impossible mountain. It looks uh, really fierce, like a fortress, no? Like a tower, as the name says. Looks like almost something from a Dr. Seuss book mixed with a nightmare. Probably the most beautiful mountain you can see. Every side you look at it, it's terrible. It's like a, oh my God. Steep on all sides, no easy way to the top, like sort of a climber's mountain in every way. Cerro Torre is notoriously fickle. Like going to the moon, basically. All right, Alex, how hard is it to get to Cerro Torre, especially like in 19, the late 1950s? Like, how difficult is that? Yeah, it's hard to imagine how remote Cerro Torre would have felt in the 1950s, because even now, it's quite a long ways to travel to the tip of South America. And back then, there was no town of Shelton. There was no road connecting Calafate to Shelton. I mean, I doubt Calafate was was much either. I mean, they probably road tripped from Buenos Aires. Uh, it's just, it's so far. It's the middle of nowhere. And then, even when you get to the middle of nowhere, that's kind of where your base camp is. Then you have to trek deeper into the middle of nowhere, basically onto an ice cap. I mean, technically onto the glacier on the other side. But either way, like getting into to Saratore is really far back there. I mean, it must have felt to go from Italy to Buenos Aires to the tip of Patagonia to like the tip of South America and then to hike into the middle of nowhere onto a glacier would have felt like the most remote place on Earth. I mean, even getting to Antarctica nowadays is easier than getting to the tip of South America would have been 70 years ago. I don't think there's anywhere in the modern world that's as remote as Saratori would have felt in the 1950s. I mean, it was an expedition of unfathomable proportions just for, to get from Buenos Aires down to what we now call the Chalten Massif. Uh, you know, it took like a week on of driving on old dirt roads, and then you had a river crossing. There was no town. There were there were just some like sheep ranchers and pastures, and it, it, I mean, it was really uh, an incredibly wild place. And I mean, it's not just the remoteness that makes it hard to climb down there, right? Like, I feel like it's also known for being kind of brutal. Basically, the wind in Patagonia is legendary, and that's because it whips around the earth with nothing to hit it, nothing to stop it except for Patagonia. So it's receiving the full brunt of any wind in the the southern hemisphere, it feels like. I mean, the wind is insane. You hear all the stories about the wind, and you're like, how bad can it be? I've been on windy days. Then you go down there, and you're like, no, no, this is really different than any windy day that I've ever experienced. You don't know about wind until you try to deal with it down there. To a certain type of climber, those two things, coupled with descriptions of towering peaks covered in ice and snow and immaculate granite, it makes a pretty irresistible challenge. We'll be back with more after the break. Kelly, who is Cesare Maestri? Cesare Maestri was this Italian climber. He was kind of known as a, a bit of a loner, a bit of a rebel. Maestri was from Trentino, which is an autonomous mountain region in northern Italy. And after World War II, his family had been forced into exile. So it kind of instilled in him this importance of being independent. In the pictures, Maestri, he looked like a fairly burly, strong guy. He was dark and muscular, oftentimes brooding pictures of him. He's not always smiling, often has like a, a bit of an intense look, a bit of a scowl on his face. And he, he was he was an iconoclast. I mean he was he was a a rebel, like for real. Like like he went off and did his own thing. I mean he he marched to his own drum. I mean he he was his own guy. He was a fierce independent. He considered himself an anarchist. You could say he took his climbing very seriously, like once he even boasted. When I made love to a woman, I did so in the press-up position to strengthen my arms. And he mostly climbed alone. And so his bold solos, they earned him a reputation and a nickname. Oragno della Dolomiti, the spider of the Dolomites. 
And when he did climb with a partner, he insisted that he would be the one to lead everything. But even to someone like Maestri, Saratori was humbling. Alex, did you climb in the Tories the, the first time you went to Patagonia? No, my first season in Patagonia, we didn't climb on the Tories at all, basically because we lacked the skills for it. Neither of us really had the ice climbing uh, confidence to go up on the Tories. It's crazy, though, that, like, you know, not that far away from the Torres, there's all this rock on the Fitzroy Massif. Um, but in the Torres, there's so much ice and snow. Yeah, the summit of Fitzroy is probably only a mile or two or, you know, a couple miles as the crow flies from the su- summit of Saratori. And you can see them right next to each other. And if it weren't for the thousands and thousands of feet of technical rock climbing separating them, you know, you could walk between it in, in under an hour, probably. I mean, depending which side of Fitzroy you're climbing on and how nice the weather is, you'd be rock climbing in a t-shirt and be like, what a beautiful day. And then over on the other side, you have someone tunneling through rime ice on Saratori having like the most epic experience of their life. (laughs) You're kind of like, and it's the same mountain range, but they're just a couple miles apart with really different weather patterns. Kelly, can you give me some context here? Like, why does this mountain matter to all these Italians? Like, it's got to be as far away as it really could be from Italy, and they seem to all have a fascination with it. Serratore and Patagonia had become an obsession with Italian climbers. This, this wasn't just a climb. I mean, this represented something far greater for them. Yeah, I definitely think it's hard for modern climbers to appreciate the role of nationalism in climbing in the past. Though, I also think it's hard for modern people to appreciate the role of nationalism in sort of politics in the past. Italy had just been decimated. Yeah, the Italians, they had suffered through the rise of fascism and Mussolini. This civil conflict and defeat in World War II, and and then there was this economic catastrophe that followed the defeat, and so they were really looking for a way, any way, to express some pride in their country. One of these expressions of national pride was being the first to plant your country's flag atop the world's highest peaks. Over here, we can't really even begin to appreciate what the ascent of K2 meant to the Italians. In 1954, Lino Lassadelli and Achille Compagnone, they summited K2 for the first time, and it was huge news. Like 40,000 people showed up at the port when they came home. And Italy basically becomes totally mad for climbing. Like, climbers are angling to do the next great thing and to be that hero that Italy really needs. And then that kind of took off from there and shaped everything that has happened on territory since. So my, my Maestri returned in 1959 with this ace Austrian climber named Tony Egger. Egger was one of the best ice climbers in the world. And he was going to be Maestri's ticket to this rhyme-covered summit of Torre. So the guy who never let anyone lead, well, he was going to make an exception. What was Tony Ager like? Uh, Tony was known as being uh, understated, humble, somewhat laconic, um, kind of had a, a quiet confidence about him. Um, he's a climber's climber by by pretty much all accounts. He had done he had done some really impressive climbing in the Dolomites. And some of them quite fast on rock climbs. And then in 1957, but this is probably part of where his reputation as an ice climber came, came about. In 1957, he and his partner made the first ascent of Jirashanka in Peru. And it was a really impressive ascent. It may have been the hardest technical climb done in the Andes at the time. And it, it was all snow and ice climbing. And so he, he was really a well-rounded climber by all accounts. Maestri and Egger, they team up with Fava, and with the help of some university students, they establish a base camp under Saratori. They stared up at the mountain, and they plotted their attack on the north face. Now, remember, that's the sunny aspect in the southern hemisphere, but they said that this big storm came in and left the mountain coated in a sheet of ice, which, when you're down there, you could see how somebody might think that, um, because they get covered in rime you know, rime ice in it, but it's basically like freezer burn and it's 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 not like modern ice climbing. For weeks, Maestri, Egger, and Fava, they just sat and waited. The mountains were totally hidden in the clouds as storms ravaged the peaks. But then finally the storm cleared. Here's where the story kinda kinda becomes mythology. 
For six days, Maestri and Edgar were up on the mountain, and Fava was waiting down below. I think for Fava, there was quite a bit of pride associated with it. He, he was the guy who, who brought the great spider of the Dolomites over here to do the greatest ascent in history. After days of waiting, Fava almost gives up on them. And then he sees this speck up on the glacier. Tony, Tony, Tony. And it's almost like a movie, right? Yeah, and so once Maestri is nursed back from the dead, he tells Fava what's happened in the last six days. And during that time, that's when Maestri says that he and Tony Egger made this fantastical blast up the east and north faces of Cerro Torre. He says that they summit, but on the way down, tragedy strikes. And the story was that this avalanche had come and after they had summited on their descent, and took Tony Yeager away. And Maestri, he gives all the credit to Egger. He says that he never would have been able to climb Cerro Torre without him. I don't think anybody doubts that Maestri was grieving at, at the loss of his partner. You know, this was an era of, of great machismo and also a lot of pride associated with your ascents. And and by by doing so, by, by giving all the credit to, to Egger, it, it suddenly becomes kind of hard to, to doubt him. They're unable to find Tony Egger's body. And so Fava and Maestri, they just pack up and go home, mourning but triumphant. Maestri returned to Italy, a hero, having made what none other than Lionel Ture, who had made the first ascent of neighboring Fitzroy, had called the greatest ascent in the history of climbing. Well, that's that's all. That's, should we just cap the story right there and call it freaking great? What a heroic story! I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm so psyched for him. <laughs> totally, it's a great story. Um, the problem is, it 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 didn't happen. We'll be back with more after the break. So, so the question is, like, what happened during those six days? If they weren't climbing Cerro Torre, where were they? Seems like the most important rule in climbing is to be honest, just to not lie, to be to be honest about what you've done and how you've done it. I think everything else in climbing can be debated as to style and, and technique and, and how you do things. But as long as you're honest about the way in which you did it, people will generally, you know, accept that. There's no such thing as cheating, just lying. You know, you come down and you, you tell that story, you tell that lie. The thing is, because of the magnitude of the ascent, you tell it once and you're trapped. You have to stick to it. You have to keep telling it. You know, I like to think that my history wasn't trying to to perpetrate the the biggest hoax in climbing of all time. I think of it more as like a like a simple, you know, he and his partner went out on an adventure, his partner died, he kind of wanted to honor his partner, he kind of, you know, thought that it wouldn't be that big a deal and that nobody would really notice. And it's like, yeah, of course we did this. Like, yeah, it's cool. We, you know, we made it to the top and then wound up sort of being caught in this lie that turned out to be much bigger than he expected. You know, Maestri became a prisoner, a prisoner of his own lie, because especially when it's at that scale, once you tell it once, you have to stick with it. Yeah, that's the thing is, it's nice to think that maybe he was just trying to honor his fallen partner in a way and didn't really know how to do it without sort of fabricating like something great for his partner to have achieved. But then that just got away from him and he spent the whole rest of his life trying to live down this lie or live up to this lie. I mean, depending how you look at it, but but trying to live with the lie. He, here's the whole thing about it, though, Alex. Like, like, who the fuck is ever going to know? That's the that's the thing about lies. It, you never know how how the future might betray you. This lie of Maestri's, it unraveled slowly over the course of decades. As climbing progressed and more alpinists were able to seize Cerro Torre for themselves, the mountain of evidence grew and grew. Every season, the world's best climbers would go down to Patagonia to try to repeat Maestri's climb, but they couldn't do it. In all those failed attempts, they started to add up, and people, well, they started, they started to talk, they started to wonder. You know, surely there were doubts. Um, most people didn't dare say it. In Maestri, when he got home, he did go see Tony Egger's family, 
but they weren't really satisfied with all the details that Maestri was able to provide for them, and so they actually asked Maestri if he'd brought home Tony's journal. He kept this meticulous journal, and surely that had been at their base camp, but Maestri never gave it to them and never talked to the Edgar family again. And they supposedly had a camera with them that got lost yes. with Tony Edgar. Right, right. Yeah, supposedly there were there was a camera, and it was on... Tony Egger, when that whistle of death took him away. The camera was never found. So there's no camera, there's no partner, and that does happen in climbing. Like, not everyone has doubt cast on them in those situations, but something happens here. Yeah, I think we tend to give people the benefit of the doubt, both in climbing and in life. Um, And now with hindsight, it seems kind of obvious, but I'm sure at the time, like, You know, when the best climber in the world says he does something, even if it seems kind of crazy, you just chalk it up to really amazing things happen sometimes. Because we believe what we want to believe. That's as old as humankind. Despite Maestri's insistence, over the next 10 years, the doubt continued to spread amongst climbers. Except in Italy, where most climbers really stuck by him. I mean, for a while, on every 10-year anniversary, of the, of the supposed 1959 climb. They, they would hold celebrations and events, celebrating their great hero. But in 1970, the doubts that had once bubbled quietly, they exploded. Carlo Mauri, one of the climbers from the 1958 Ragni Deleco team, he went down to Patagonia to attempt Cerro Torre again. Carlo Mauri is a very famous climber for us, for, for Ragni di Lecco. I would say he's the most impressive accomplishment of all time. Matteo Della Bordella is an Italian alpinist who has climbed big walls all over the world. And he's climbed in Patagonia quite a bit. And by quite a bit, Alex means that Matteo's climbed Cerro Torre three times, once by a new route and once on the southeast ridge by fair means, which we'll get to in a later episode. Um, but Matteo's climbed a lot of other peaks in Patagonia as well, including a first ascent on Torre Eger. And back home in Italy, Matteo was the president of the Ragni di Lecco from 2018 to 2021. So he went to Cerro Torre twice, Carlo Mauro. The first time was with Walter Bonatti in 1958, and they reached the so-called... Uh, we really shouldn't understate that there was a lot of competitiveness, right? Like the the year before Maestri and Eggers' infamous climb, Carlo Mari and Walter Bonatti, they had already been to Patagonia to try territory and they failed. And they reached this point up on the coal called the Coal of Hope. They reached this this coal that they called the Coal of Hope. And they had made their attempt and retreated and wrote some beautiful lines about you know, their attempt and and just like how they just sat there it, in silence and magnificence. It, basically, they, they had just gotten thoroughly thrashed and they were like, to- but they were like totally like humbled and full of awe and reverence. And, they, and, they, and there's a line from them. He's like, and we just sat there for a long time in silence. And it's one of my favorite lines uh, from Seratory history because I, I think just the context of it showed this attitude of, you know, humility and reverence for the place. But Maestri, he didn't think hope really had any place in climbing. Up on the other side, there's a call between Cerro Torre and Torre Eger. And Maestri actually has surely never reached that call, uh, despite all of his stories. But he had named it anyway, and he called it the Coal of Conquest. And it was a pointed dig at... Uh, Benadi and Mori with the Coal of Hope. He said something to the effect of in the mountains, there's no such thing as hope, only the will to conquer. Hope is the weapon of the weak. And all this history, all this competitiveness, it must have been ringing in Mari's ears when in 1970, he decided to go back. When he went uh, to Patagonia, for the second time in 1970, uh, leading another expedition from Rai di Lecco where they failed to climb Cerro Torre. So they, like other teams before them, they failed on Cerro Torre. But unlike previous groups, Mari would actually say the thing that everyone had been thinking. He said, we are coming back alive from the impossible Cerro Torre. That's right, the impossible Cerro Torre. 
And that sort of makes it to the press? That line ran as a headline in one of Italy's biggest newspapers. And the implications of that were huge. By calling Serratore impossible, Maori was saying that it couldn't and hadn't been climbed. He was the first to publicly doubt Maestri, but he wouldn't be the last. Maestri was enraged. He was not going to let the doubters take away his prize. Maestri uh, took it really seriously. I mean, it was not uh, something like, okay, whatever he says, this, and I don't care. But Maestri took it really seriously, and uh, in fact, he decided to go back to Cerro Torre and, uh, and try to climb it from a different way. He, he seemed enraged. Uh, so, some of the quotes from him just seemed to point at this, like, this dueling mix of, like, anger and resentment and whatever sorts of personal baggage he brought there with him, um, rage, but also mixed with, but he, he also didn't seem immune to the natural beauty of the place. There's a beautiful line that he wrote upon waking from one of, the, from one of his bivvies. Um, the day breaks forth in all its glory, and sweeping away the ghosts of fear of the night or something like that. You know, it's like, wow. That's really beautiful, man. And then he fires up the motor engine and <laughs> jackhammers away. You're like, Jesus, wow. Yeah, that, I think the guy was complicated. Maestri was going back. And this time, he would put all the doubt to rest. He was going to the summit. And in 1970, Maestri returned to Cerro Torre, armed with a 150-pound gas-powered air compressor. Next time on Climbing Gold. Maestri was controversial from the very beginning. It was totally unprecedented tactics. Bam, 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 bolts every fucking where. He chopped the last hundred feet, saying that it would be impossible for anyone to climb it. This seemed like the work of a madman. Got over there and the fox was eating some remains. Turns out it was Tony Egger. If you're not scared, you're not having fun. If that's true, Cerro Torre is worth a couple of years at Disneyland. A big thanks to Kelly Cordes for helping us tell this story. Kelly's incredible book, The Tower, a chronicle of climbing and controversy on Cerro Torre, inspired this series. It's a great read. Check it out wherever you find your books. Climbing Gold is a production of Duct Tape Then Beer. Alex Honnold is our host. Today's episode was written by Lauren Delaney Miller. Creative direction and story supervision by me, Fitzka Hall. Edited, mixed, and mastered by Evan Phillips, who also created the original score for this series. Additional music by Joey Kanner, courtesy of Track Club. Our theme music is by Brennan O'Connell. Skylar Perwins is our YouTube and social media editor. Our executive producers are Jonathan Redzik and Ben Endy for RxR Sports and Lisey Hendricks and Becca Call for Duct Tape Them Beer. Thanks for listening.